This is my first trip to India. And it's been a very revealing, wonderful experience for me. And uh, thank you very much for welcoming me and my wife Sue to your, your country. I've been struck by how open and generous the people here are, all of you people. Everybody I've met has been very willing to talk to me, to look at me, and to engage me. And um, yeah, it's a wonderful thing. The, everybody is friendly, and they're smart. Everyone is, I mean, there's a lot of depth here. And there's one other quality that I see throughout the people that I meet. Regardless, yesterday we went on a long tour of Bangalore, and we saw, uh, we went to some very upscale houses and some very downscale houses. And uh, what we saw was family. We saw this, this, this understanding that family is, is who we are and it's what ties us together and we have great value of that. And the company that my wife and I started 20, now 26 years ago, Cooper, um, was also a family company, run by a family and we brought family values to the business. And so I, uh, I understand that. I value it the same way. Now, you may not know this, um, but in October, just a few months ago, Cooper was acquired by, well, by Design It, which was acquired by Wipro. So we're, we're now part of Wipro, which is a, a local company and one that is, I think, could also be described as a family. So I feel very much at home in that, as, as part of that organization. And so I'm an honorary leader. Thank you. Um, this picture is a picture of where Sue and I live. It's seven years ago, we left our, our Silicon Valley house in the, in the heart of, of a fast moving Silicon Valley, and we bought a, uh, a ranch on it, about an hour outside of town. And, uh, and this is what it looks like. We call it Monkey Ranch. We, have you ever heard the expression monkey business? Yeah, well, there's a little of that. And monkey wrenches, I like to make things. I'm a tool guy, and a monkey wrench is a tool. And, uh, and we also have a cat named Monkey. Anyway, what you'll see is the background to a lot of my slides. These lush green ones are pictures of Monkey Ranch, and, and they're a fitting background to a lot of the thinking that's gone into my presentation came from my moving out to the country and seeing life. So now, let's get going here. Can everyone hear me okay? Way in the back, can you see me okay? I see a couple of hands going up. That's a, a good, okay. So today, I want to talk about the way I like to approach my work. It's not unique, but it's somewhat rare, and I call it working backwards. It's widely useful, but it's most powerful as a tool for innovation and creativity. A less obvious application is its usefulness in managing the creative process. Working backwards also gives you insight into a larger world and what your responsibilities are as a citizen. Simply put, working backwards means questioning every assumption before you accept it. You first step backwards with genuine inquiry, and only then do you proceed forwards with knowledge and confidence. Now, it may seem like a waste of time to question every assumption, but rushing in the wrong direction gets you nowhere. The world is simply not out there, breathlessly awaiting the release of your poorly conceived product. 
Now, working backwards gives you three main advantages. It helps you know your user and their goals. It helps you to see possible solutions. And it helps you to see the bigger picture. And I'll talk about each of these as we go today. Now, you've probably heard that old saying, success is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. There's a lot of truth to that little, to that saying, and a little bit of vision can be the foundation for a huge amount of hard work. Working backwards is how you find your vision. It's that 1% inspiration, but all the sweat comes from working forwards. You can't escape that huge quantity of perspiring work. It has to be done. The problem is, that creating massive failures takes just as much hard work and perspiration. The difference is the 1% inspiration that comes from working backwards. What differentiates successful products from failures is something new and different, something better and friendlier, something that hasn't been done before, or something that has never been this easy to use or to learn. And we call such differentiation innovation. And it comes with a built-in conundrum, a dilemma. Innovation, by definition, is doing something counterintuitive, something that has never been done before. And if you've never done it before, it's a certainty that you don't know how to do it yet. So regardless of your previous experience with similar projects, the more innovative it is, the more it diverges from the known. Working backwards demands that you do things differently. Or, to use the proper management term, you're doing it the wrong way. You won't just be doing this in a vacuum. You have to fight for your right to work backwards. And working backwards really pisses me. I've always worked backwards. I just naturally question assumptions. I don't just want to see results. I want to see how things work. I don't just want to see the play. I want to see what goes on backstage. I'm a born rule breaker and a shit disturber and a road less traveled guy. As a young man, I wore my hair long, I dropped out, and I always did what people said I shouldn't do. For 40 years, I've been designing, and writing, and critiquing software and technology. And working backwards is my superpower. When someone tells me I have to choose between A, B, I always choose C. It really pisses me off. Over the years, I've invented many design tools for working backwards, like pair design, user personas. One of our oldest tools is an exercise called Pretend It's Magic. More than any other, it exemplifies the power of working backwards to break new ground and to frustrate conventional thinkers. Pretending it's magic is easy. You just ask yourself, how would we solve this problem if anything were possible? Typically, Conventional design and engineering begins with a ritual recitation of constraints and requirements. These tell you what you can't do and what you must do. But this approach condemns you to doing what you already know in ways that you're already familiar with. It's a roadblock to innovation. It's assuming before knowing. It's working forwards before you've worked backwards. It emphasizes history, convention, old technology, old mental models, and just the way we do things around here. Instead, it's better to work backwards. Start by throwing out everything, all your assumptions, all those known limitations. For the moment, just assume that all technical problems can be solved, that all organizational hurdles can be overcome, and that all resources are available. 
only imagine the possibilities. What does the user want? And what would make the user happy? For example, if you have to build a bridge across a river, you would normally start by building concrete abutments and then laying steel girders between them. But when you build a bridge backwards, you start by asking, what is the fundamental purpose of the bridge? Who needs to get across the stream? Why? Are there existing fords or ferries that could do the job? And what else could it be? Now you can see the objective with more clarity. You can better understand why this bridge needs to exist. And the essential feature set becomes clearer. You can see what isn't needed, what doesn't belong, and those tasks that don't need to be done anymore. More importantly, you can see the opportunities to do more than people ask for, to go beyond the minimum requirements, to give people a car instead of just a faster horse, or a whale instead of a cucumber, or to put a dent in the universe. You probably still have to build a bridge, but now you can clearly see how to build the bridge more efficiently and make it more effective for its users. Maybe be something more. Maybe, like this small northern California town, the citizens realized that the simple footbridge that they needed to build should do more than just get pedestrians across the Sacramento River. That its soaring tower should tell time. That it should unite their town and be a source of civic pride, that it could become a symbol of their city and revitalize it by becoming a popular tourist attraction. The Sundial Bridge, a simple but elegant crossing, is a huge success and has done as much for the small country town of Reading as the Golden Gate Bridge has done for San Francisco. It's counterintuitive to make a bridge tell time and be a tourist attraction. And when it was first proposed, it probably was flawed. When you work forwards, you take what you have and you improve it incrementally. But when you work backwards, you examine its underlying purpose and what it's trying to accomplish, its goals. Companies have their goals and you have to satisfy them. But users usually have different goals. Theirs are more important. Companies often imagine that their purpose is equivalent to their users, and that's one reason why those companies fail. So, when your boss tells you to deliver some feature or some service to your user, you have to first find out what the user really wants. You have to seek out your users and listen to them. You need to learn their motivations and get into their heads to absorb their mental models. You question the nature of your product and you reshape the experience. You change the fundamental value of the product, which in turn affects the strategy of the entire business. Working backwards is doing what you don't know how to do in the hopes of finding a better way to do it. Working forwards is doing what you do know how to do because you've done it before and you know it works. Above all, working backwards is a challenge to you. A challenge to step back and ask why. A challenge to look outside the known boundaries, to ask yourself and others some really tough questions. Eventually, you find yourself asking even bigger questions beyond business, questions about our society, our government, and about social justice. The more you work backwards, the more connections you see in the world around you, the more inequality you detect, and the more opportunities to make a better world. Each way of working has different characteristics. Some of the differences between working forwards and backwards are Forwards confirms what you think, while backwards discovers something new. Forwards optimizes the existing, while backwards develops the opportunity. 
Forwards is brittle. Backwards could adapt to changes. Forwards concentrates on constraints and requirements, while backwards looks at new possibilities. And forwards asks, where are we right? Backwards asks, where are we wrong? Now let's talk about the first strength of working backwards, knowing who your user is and what they're trying to accomplish. So Cooper, the innovation consulting company that my wife Sue and I founded 26 years ago, now part of Design It, owned by Coco. <clears throat> Over the years, we've served clients large and small around the country around the world. <clears throat> Cooper uses what we call the goal-directed method because it's based on understanding the user's goals. While we tailor our efforts for the particular situation, everything we do is based on the simple idea that knowing the user's goals helps you design them. First, you identify your user. Who are they? What differentiates them? You'd be surprised how many companies don't know who their user is. Second, you determine what their desired end state is. What's their goal? Where do they want to end up? Then third, you find out what motivates them to get there. Sometimes it's just because they want to go home to their family. You need to ask the question, why do they want to do it? Knowing these three things informs everything a company must do to innovate you lose sight of them. It just doesn't matter how cool your products are. They're not going to see you. Now, when Cooper first started 26 years ago, designing digital systems was in its infancy. Now, I had been building them for 15 years, so I knew the territory. But there were no academic programs, no books, no process, no tools, no terminology, no job roles, and certainly no industry credibility. We had to invent both a practice and a profession. And all we had was our commitment to making software easier for humans to use. At each step of the way, we worked from first principles. Who is the user? What are their goals? And why? We started out as an interaction design company, showing our clients how to get more done with fewer screens. But the more we worked backwards, the more powerful we became. We discovered that our tools and techniques for interaction design were precisely the tools needed to innovate. Using them, we assist our clients to create, to invent, and to transform their businesses from being product-centered to user-centered. This is why today we call ourselves an innovation company. As my friend Molly Nix of Uber says, design is the process used to build products. That is, design is not a phase in the process. It is the process. When you work backwards, design is not just a part of business, but rather business becomes a part of design. Design is what informs every aspect of the business. And it has more to do with success than manufacturing, marketing, sales, or finance. We don't have any illusions <clears throat> about being experts in our clients' business. They have been doing their business for years, and it's almost a certainty that they know their users and what they should provide to them. The problem is typically that the correct answers are hidden amongst the incorrect ones, the way the trees hide the forest. A client once described us as experts at becoming experts. We know how to learn a lot from very modest input. Our job is to guide the client onto the right road, not to carve that road for them. Often our job is to show them a new way of seeing what they see every day. The value that we bring is our perspective as deeply interested outsiders. We enter as a tabula rasa, a blank slate, without any preconceptions. 
We're looking for unexpected patterns in amorphous data. We call our stance omnivorous and non-judgmental. We want to hear everything about anything from everyone. Or, as I like to say, we draw on our deep well of ignorance. Now, for the sake of practicality, this has to be done quickly. But speed is our ally. Imagine that you were trying to assess the quality of the smoothness of a surface. To get an overall read of the quality, you have to work backwards. You really want to sweep your hand quickly across the width of it to feel for any roughness. You touch it in one place to confirm a rough spot to repair, but you sweep across it to get the big picture of what needs work. Recently, one of Cooper's favorite clients provided a great example of how this works. And by the time we were done, both Cooper and the client were surprised by what we had learned. Village Plus is United Airlines' loyal manager, managing free to fly on us. They hired Cooper to help them generate more trading volume. They wanted more members to redeem more miles for more merchants. But they already had a lot of valuable data, but the data wasn't telling you. They knew about their users' travel patterns, their incomes, their demographics, and market segmentation. But what exactly does that mean? Now, user personas is one of the inventions that's been widely adopted in the design world. They are hypothetical archetypes based on empirical research that represent real users. Now, some people will tell you that Personas are obsolete, or they don't work. They just don't know how to make them or to use them. We find personas to be one of the most effective tools in our kit, and we use them on virtually every project we do. In this case, senior Cooper designers Nate Clinton and Steve Cawley went into the field and observed Mileage Plus users in their natural habitat. They weren't trying to find out what offers they but instead sought to discover their goals. Nate and Steve found three groups with different goals. They then created three representative personas. Neil, the million miler, the road warrior, all he wants is comfort. He wants his flight upgrades and he wants more leg room. Margaret, who flies for business, but not very much. She loves collecting her miles, and she dreams of that big vacation trip. And then there's Bradley, digitally adept, millennial youth. He doesn't fly that much. He sure likes to get free stuff. Now, these personas are not based on demographics, but on what they want and why they want it. The client mostly liked Neil and Margaret, because Neil and Margaret are already the biggest users. And they always seem to provide the best opportunity. <laughs> we worked with two senior executives there. The first executive was a marketing guy. And he knew what he wanted from the very beginning. Their current solution was emailing attractive merchandise offers, but members mostly. So executive one wanted us to create a mobile that would deliver even more attractive merchandise offers. Classic working forwards, doing more of the same, only doing it harder on a new platform. And we expressed our grave doubts about this plan, explaining that more advertisements on more platforms weren't what their users wanted. And executive number one was really pissed off. Actually fired us. That's another story. But it was at this point that the Mileage Plus executive number two stepped in. He was willing to work backwards. The narrative that he heard from our personas was new and original and compelling. He saw a previously obscured opportunity with the persona of the young, tattooed Bradley. Executive number two then showed us an orphaned technology the company had previously worked on but it then discarded. They could generate retail gift cards on the fly, in a store, on a smartphone. They had thrown it away because they didn't see a way to make money. 
Working closely with executive number two, we developed a plan, a design, and then we built a mobile product. It was released as United Mileage Plus X, a smartphone app aimed squarely at the smallest but most promising market. Users could get at least double miles by using the app to buy merchandise inside retail stores. This was a key motivator for Bradley. The X app has been hugely successful for our client. With it, users generated over $100 million in trade in just the first year. We know members love it. It's 35 cents a day. And every month, the app grows by 20 cents in the very desirable millennium segment. All of the realities of innovation are present in this story. It took exploration, humor, and a willingness to question closely held beliefs. And it pissed people off. The executive knew his gift card, te gift card technology was cool, but it wasn't useful until we could look at it through the lens of the user. Field studies are an exercise in searching for what we don't know we don't know, rather than as a confirmation of our assumptions. And as is often the case, the client already had the answer, but they needed some outside perspective to help them to see it in its true light. The Mileage Plus X app nicely demonstrates another important notion, and it is that working forwards is an integral part of the process. First, we did the sweep. Then we did the touch. Now, executive number one was a smart guy. And for me, as a lifelong entrepreneur, I know that his self-confidence and his relentless drive is what makes product real. And it is indispensable to success. But I've also been a lifelong inventor, and I know that my constant willingness to question my assumptions is equally indispensable. It's the quality that innovates and delights users. So I arrive at this axiom. Your ego gets it built, but it's your humility that gets it loved. And to, to succeed, in a world of innovation, you need both of these things. Okay, now let's talk about the second right, of working back, helping you to see possible solutions. <clears throat> in 2005, I took a year of machinist training at night at City College a two-year technical college in San Francisco. That's my classroom. I learned how to shape steel on the lathe and the milling machine. These are my two biggest last projects, a thumbs and a pair of involute gears. The instructor would give us a blueprint of what we had to make, then he'd demonstrate the method, then he'd let us do it for ourselves. This ancient craft isn't about radical innovation, but about mastery of tools processes. The thing about cutting steel is that it isn't very forgiving. If you aren't doing it right, things go pear-shaped very quickly. So I worked backwards. I would measure, plan, set up my work, then I'd ask around. Then I'd measure again, change my setup, plan, measure, all before I put the tool to the metal. And I began to notice it pattern. I always was the last student to start cutting steel. But even more interesting, I was always the first student to finish, and I had good results, too. The lesson here is a simple one. Starting sooner doesn't mean finishing sooner. You need to be willing to give yourself time to be correct. The surprise is that this lesson comes straight out of the industrial age. In the digital world, it's even more true. Not because the technology is so hard to change, but because people have already made up their minds. And minds are harder to change than software.
In general, for most people, it doesn't come naturally to work backwards. Your gut intuition and your common sense aren't good enough anymore. Do they ever work? Human awareness and behavior is deeply biased. Over the last few decades, the science of human cognition has made remarkable advances. Contrary to popular belief, humans don't hear what we think we hear, and we don't see what we think we see, and we don't make decisions on rational ground. Accepting truth is hard for any one of us, but it's particularly hard for business people who have depended on common sense for centuries. <clears throat> John Manusian began this delightful codex of known human cognitive illusions, any one of which would lead us astray. But taken together, you'd see by so many of these how defenseless we are to our own misunderstandings and misconceptions. Adding insult to injury is that a subset of these illusions have the sole effect of making us disbelieve the truth and instead doubling it out on our goofy thinking. These include such illusions as confirmation bias, where we only listen to things that agree with what we already know, or zero risk bias, where we'd rather be certain than correct. Cognitive biases pervade institutions as well, and they manifest as silent cultural taboos. For example, most companies are biased toward success. This means that no matter how much they say over and over again, fail fast, failure is not a good thing for your career. Most companies are also biased towards action, which means that they reward hard work more than they reward patient reflection about whether or not that work should be done. It takes, <clears throat> it takes strenuous mental effort to think objectively. Common sense is just our cognitive biases speak. And it makes me wonder if we're subject to this daunting plethora of bad ways of thinking, how could humans have ever emerged from the ooze? Is that moving for you as much as this for me? In his book, Thinking Fast and Slow, the Nobel Prize winner Daniel Kahneman explains. Humans have two entirely separate mechanisms of thought that he calls fast and slow. If I ask you your name, the fast part of your mind answers automatically. But if I ask you to multiply 16 by 7, you stop walking. That's the slow part. We all have and it works just fine, but it consumes a lot of energy, so it's very, very lazy. Anytime a fast-thinking mind offers an alternative answer, we snap it up before we bother to get our slow-thinking mind out of bed. So we think, yesterday we made money, so tomorrow we do the same, take more money. That's fast-thinking, that's easy. But if we do something new and different, we'll let that make Ah, see, now to answer that means that we have to wake up our low thinking mind, and that's hard. Now, how most of you have noticed the clever parallel between slow thinking and work backwards. When you work backwards, you have to engage the slow thinking part of your mind. It's another clue to why working backwards is counterintuitive. In the industrial age, Westerners learned to make machines of gears, belts, and levers. No matter how complex such machines get, they remain simple, deterministic systems. They're not complex systems, like personal relationships, natural ecosystems, corporate cultures, and software platforms. Unfortunately, it's so much easier to think of complex systems as simple systems with single simple causes and single simple effects. We tell stories, 
and we cite anecdotes so we can believe this, all in an effort to rely on the lazy, fast-thinking part of our minds and spare the hard work of thinking slowly about complexity. The problem is that we can tweak complex systems as though they were simple machines. And we can often get predictable results. But that's not all you get. In John Gall's memorable phrase, any time you act upon a complex system, the system always kicks back. In other words, you might get the results you want, but you will always get some other unintended consequences. And you probably would like it. You can start fracking in Oklahoma, for example, and quintuple your yields of oil, but you also destroy the state's bedrock. In all of recorded history, Oklahoma had no measurable seismic activity. But when they began fracking in 2009, Oklahoma became the most seismically active state in the continental U.S., with more than 1,000 earthquakes of 3.0 higher every year for the California. There are always unintended consequences when you mess with complex systems, and frequently the downside of the consequence is much greater than the predicted upside. Social media is another example of unintended consequences. At first, it was an amazing tool for keeping us together and for uniting old friends. But the algorithms Facebook and Twitter use create a personal echo chamber for each of us. Increasingly, the only thoughts and opinions we see are those that match our own. Gradually, we lose sight of what is really happening in the world. The creators of social media only wanted to help, but no one could predict those second order effects. <clears throat> All right, now it's time to talk, talk about the third strength of working backwards. And this is helping you to see the bigger picture. You and I are the practitioners. We are the backwards workers, the slow thinkers. We're building the future out of design and behavior. And it's our job to ask the hard questions. In my 40 years in the trenches, I've come to know which questions are the toughest. The first tough question isn't, what should we do here? But it's rather, what is our goal? The second tough question isn't, whose fault is this? But rather, whose responsibility is this? Our job doesn't stop at making it. Robert Oppenheimer, the inventor of the atomic bomb, made a great product. Upon seeing the bomb explode for the first time, he began to question the role of the atomic bomb in the world. He started working backwards, and he discovered that his real goal, his ultimate responsibility, was to be a good ancestor. We have now, as a an industry arrived at our own Robert Oppenheimer moment. When we work backwards hard enough, our vision expands and we see beyond our product and beyond our company until we can sweep our hand across the fabric of the entire social world. And we feel that we know that we have work to do. We look up from our screens, we see a world rife with inequality. And the products we work on every day are often the root cause of that inequality. We see that our little microcosm of software, web apps, social media, and shopping carts has eaten the world. And now we're trying to digest it. Our legislative protections have failed. From a citizen's point of view, Uber is a taxi company, and Airbnb is a hotel chain. But because their business models are innovative, they claim to be something different, and they escape the regulations that protect us. Working backwards is the only way we're going to invent a legal mechanism 
that can keep pace with disruptive innovation. These are all unpredictable, unintended consequences of innovation. It's nobody's fault, but it's become our job to fix things. When we work backwards far enough, our goal is revealed not as making product or profit, but creating a peaceful, just, and fair society for everyone. One that we would be proud to pass on our friendship. Think this is our job. We're just technologists tweaking bits. But increasingly, the levers of the economy are in our hands. When we wonder who's responsible to do this, we must ask ourselves Congressman John Lewis's famous question If not us, then who? And if not now, then then. It may not be something we ask for, and it may not be something we want. But the responsibility for and the power to create a just and peaceful society is more in our hands than in anybody else's. So how can we use our privilege as educated and affluent people to achieve this desired end state? We're like the keystone in the arch. The system won't stay up without us. Here's where our ego and our humility come together to make our world better. We have a big job in front of us. So now you see the power of working backwards. It connects you to your users so you can really get to know them and understand their motivations and goals. And it gives you a fresh point of view so you can find innovative approaches. And it gives you the bigger picture so you can see how your work fits into the larger world. Working backwards has implications not just for your product, but for your teams, your company, and our society. When you become an innovator, you become more powerful. And that means you must also become more responsive. You need to assess not just the immediate value of your creativity, but the long-term effects of it. There are those in our society who idolize people who make a lot of money buy big houses and yachts. Not me. I want to elevate people who fight inequality. Gustavo Petro, the mayor of Bogota, said, a developed country is not a place where the poor have cars. It's where the rich use public transportation. This is the kind of thinking that I respect. A designer who makes their projects part of the larger social world and makes the world better one app at a time. No project is too small for working backwards. The way to create a better world is to make certain every tiny piece of the world you create makes you a better answer. I think give him a standing ovation. Ah.